you weren't able to be here this morning, you can catch it online at LighthouseNiagara.com, our website, or you can go to YouTube and catch it there at Lighthouse Niagara. This morning was about glorifying Him in who we are. How can we glorify Him? Tonight, I want to continue glorifying Him for who He is, for who He is in our life. This morning, one of the or passages that we went around was Luke 2.14, that, that the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. It was probably about almost two years after that night that the wise men, the magi, came from the east. And I want to read just quickly Matthew 2 uh, of that account, starting at verse 1. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, so not far from Jerusalem, for thus it is written by the prophet, this is the prophet Micah, and you can find this in Micah 5, verse 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, even though it was a small town. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So this was prophesied hundreds of years prior to this question that King Herod had. Where is he going to be born? Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child, not the babe, the child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented him or presented gifts to him, gold and frankincense and myrrh. These men had traveled hundreds of miles, many, a great distance, to worship Jesus, to worship this child. Who is this child they worshiped, and why would they come so far? I just want you to know, I like the fact these magi, they were intellectuals. They were teachers, they were scholars, they were men that were learned, they were astronomers, and here they were coming to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he? Interesting passage written, written 1,000 years prior, prior to Jesus coming. Proverbs 30, verse 4. So approximately a 1,000 years B.C., Solomon writes, Who has ascended into heaven or descended? And you note that these, this verse is a bunch of questions. Interesting. Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has the power to take the winds, to gather wind in his fists. Who has bound the waters in a garment? 
Who has established all the ends of the earth? Now, this is the part that I find very interesting. What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know? Do you know? So another question. A few hundred years later, and this passage was read as we opened the service, Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. This man, Isaiah, he, his ministry spanned four kings of Judah. So he was there not for just one king, not just two, but four kings. 66 chapters that are written, just like there are 66 books in the Bible. Isaiah has 66 chapters, and the amazing thing is there is a huge shift after you go from chapter 39, there's 39 books in the Old Testament, and you go to chapter 40, right to the end, 66, there's a huge shift because the first part is about judgment. There's a lot of judgment that you read of in the first 39 chapters, but then you get to chapter 40, and it, there is this message of hope that begins to happen and in the, right in the middle right in the middle of the last 27 chapters is chapter 53 and so there's 13 chapters before and there's 13 chapters after and central in Isaiah or sorry chapter 52 or 50 it is 53 chapter 53 is a beautiful message of Jesus Christ. And here in Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. We're, we're looking at who is this son. What is his name? What is the son's name? And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, this everlasting father, or as was mentioned earlier, this, the meaning of this, the possessor of eternity, to possess eternity, everlasting father, prince of peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will be perform this. The things that God has spoken and it was prophesied will come to pass and are coming to pass and have come to pass because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Isaiah. Interesting. There's this Meaning of Isaiah, even his name, Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. And Isaiah, this man that lived so long ago, 700 B.C., is declaring his name. Wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. That Jesus would be that to you. Paul writes regarding this one, Jesus Christ. And tonight, I, I want to look at a few passages of who we are glorifying or who we should glorify. Glorifying him for who he is. And first off, very quickly, the only one that can save us, our Savior. Jesus Christ, our Savior. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Of all the sinners, I am chief of all sinners. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy. The Lord gave me mercy, even as the worst of sinners, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all 
long-suffering or all patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. I find that interesting. In fact, who was Paul? Paul was an extremely educated, zealous man, zealous for what he believed in. He was against the way. He was against those that followed Jesus. And at the point, or he, his main focus was to persecute and seek out to persecute those that would follow Jesus Christ. And can Christ do a work of changing this chief sinner? As we recognize, you might say, man, I am too far gone. The Lord is saying, I am able to change you. I am able to, to save you. Paul says of himself in, in Acts chapter 26, and he's standing before King Agrippa. King Herod had already died, and King Agrippa was the king at that time, the king of the Jews, even though he was under the rule of the Roman Empire. And this is what Paul writes of himself. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They know you know about this. You know where I came from. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are tw uh, 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to attain. This thing of hope, the promise to God or God, God made to even to the fathers. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This also did it. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. This man, Saul, or later to be called Paul, was responsible for the death of many. And when they had a chance to... to uh, have a word or whatever, and there was a, uh, a judgment on them, Paul would always, Saul would always cast his vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus, that's the same Damascus that's in Syria today, same city. As I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we, we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. You might want to know, what is a goad? A goad is something that is, is jabbed, a stick that is jabbed to get something, to goad something forward to move. And here, Jesus is likening Paul's persecution as kicking against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? Lord. And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So the Lord is Jesus. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, 
to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. May I say this? Tonight we are here. In fact, the body of Christ, those that have become believers in Jesus Christ over the, the millennia, are as a result of Paul who went to the Gentiles. He began that, that work of ministry 2,000 years ago, and he went on three separate missionary journeys. And as a result of that, there was a declaration of Jesus Christ as Savior. And we are here as a result of the work of Paul 2,000 years ago. It's interesting. My mom is here tonight. And I got saved as a result of her witness to me and leading me in, in a prayer when I was seven years of age. I would ask you, Mom, do, do you remember who gave a message where you got saved? What, what, but the name of the man that, that, who was it? Okay, so this man by the name of Reinhold Alunska shared a message, and my mother got saved. How old were you, Mom? 15 years of age. And who knows how Reinhold Alunska got saved? And before that, and before that, and before that, and I'll say this, that the message came as Paul chose to say, I am going to go out and I'm going to speak to the Gentiles. And here we are 2,000 years later because Jesus, the message of Jesus has gone out. He is Savior and he is able to save the worst of sinners like Paul, who was responsible for the death of many followers of Jesus Christ. Not just anybody, but followers specifically of Jesus Christ. Amazing. Amazing. Who is Jesus? He is our Savior. And this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus or Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul admits. However, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me, first Jesus Christ, might show all longsuffering or patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. To have everlasting life. Secondly, I want to say, who is Jesus? Why should we glorify him? Because he is the one that gives life. And he is the one that is able to sustain and keep life even to the point of eternity. In 1 Timothy 6 verse 11, it says, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. We're not to fight against men, but to fight. The only fight that we are told to fight is the fight of, fight the good fight of faith. What is your faith in? Is it in Jesus Christ, the one that died for you? It says, lay hold on eternal life. The enemy would say, Whatever you do, do not believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. Why? Because he doesn't want you to have life. He doesn't want you to have forgiveness. He doesn't want you to have eternity with God. He wants to destroy you so that you are apart from God for eternity. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Just a few moments ago, I confessed. I came to Jesus as a seven-year-old boy because of my mother. I say, thank you, Lord. I have life eternal. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. Jesus the giver, the keeper of life, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. When I say, what good confession? It's a confession of a martyr. It's a confession of someone that knew 
he would die. That knew that within hours, even as he stood judged before this, this ruler, this Roman ruler, by name, and he's confessing, I am the Christ. He did not compromise anything, but he went to the cross. It cost him going to the cross to die horribly, and all our sins were put on him. He died for the consequences of our sins, which is eternity apart from God. From God. The wages of sin is death. Not physical, we're talking spiritual death, to be apart from God for all eternity. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ because he is the giver and the keeper of life. That is the one that we need to glorify. I like what Paul writes to this young pastor, Timothy. He says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let there be a glorifying of Jesus Christ. He is king eternal. He is immortal. No beginning, no end. Invisible, we may not see him. There is a day coming where we will stand before Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That he would receive glory forever and ever. Amen. Why should we glorify him? He is the one, Jesus Christ is the one that can purify us to make us clean of all our sin. He is the one that reconciles, the reconciler, the one that would keep us blameless. In 1 Timothy 6, 14, it says that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearance. Appearing, Jesus came 2,000 years ago with a purpose. I'm going to the cross. The next time Jesus comes back, it will be to catch us up so that we would be with him for eternity and also that we would also spend eternity with him when he comes back a 1,000 years, even here on this earth. I say, wow, is that even possible? Immortal, blameless. He is the one, the only one that can reconcile us to God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. It's interesting, this word reconcile, it basically, it has two parts to it, to this word. One of them has to do with this thing of being separated of any kind of separation of one thing from another by which the union or fellowship of the two is destroyed. So there's this thing of, of coming apart. I don't know if you've ever been, I don't know, put apart in relationship from others. You say, oh man, I, I am so upset because I have no more uh, relationship. Maybe if something said, something that was done or not done or not said, and there's no more relationship. And so there is this aspect of reconciliation that first starts with the fact that something that was once together is no longer together. But it set, the second part has to do with a returning to favor with or to be reconciled to one. To reconcile those who are at variance, there's difference between you, so you're apart, but there's a coming back to return to favor with or be reconciled to a person, to a being, to receive one into favor, to receive favor. That's what Jesus is there to do. Listen to what it says in Colossians 1.19 regarding being blameless, the one that is able to keep us blameless or purify us and also to reconcile us. Colossians 1.19 says, For it pleased the Father that in him that is Jesus, all the fullness should dwell. The fullness of God would dwell in him, fully God, fully man, even as he came 2,000 years ago. And by him, that is Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his 
cross. This peace, this reconciliation comes through him going to the cross for us. Jesus knew that he was going to the cross. It was determined beforehand that Jesus would go to the cross and to suffer. But with it, that we can have peace and reconciliation through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death because of his coming and because of his death to present you, listen, holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith. My faith is in Jesus Christ, the one that died for me. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, the good news, Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the gospel, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. And thank God that he became a minister. He was instrumental. In fact, half of the New Testament are letters written to those that got saved under Paul's ministry. And they're written for us today. This, this man that had been responsible for the death of others, God saved, and he did a work of giving him life and, and causing him to, to, to be blameless to preach about the one that would reconcile people to God. Of which I, Paul, became a minister to preach to every creature under heaven. Which we must likewise also preach to others. One of the most exciting things for me as a pastor, and outside of being a pastor, even before being a pastor, was talking about Jesus and specifically the good news of Jesus Christ for the sake of salvation. So thank you, Lord, that we have a message to give of who Jesus is, the one that purifies, that makes us blameless before God so we can have relationship with God Almighty. That he's not our judge, but rather he, we, he becomes our Father in heaven as we receive Christ. I just say thank you, Lord, for who you are. This what we celebrate in, our, in, our, in this land. I thank God we celebrate Christmas. They might celebrate other things. We have opportunity to acknowledge Jesus coming 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. As we read again, 1 Timothy 6, 14 says that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, until he comes to take us home which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potent, potentate, or potentate, which means, you say, what does that mean? Is basically an individual of, or a royal official of great authority. In this case, the greatest of all authority. All authority and power has been given to Jesus Christ after he went to the cross and after he rose from the dead. This potentate, this prince, a prince of peace. He is the king of kings and lord of lords who alone has Im immortality. There's no beginning, there's no end. Dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. There would be a glorifying of Jesus for who he is. Jesus, protector and deliverer, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. This is 2 Timothy 4, 17 and 18. He stood with me and strengthened me. This is Paul writing. So that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles may hear. A Gentile is a person that's not a Jew. So there's a lot of Gentiles on this planet. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is not just a protector for Paul, but he is also a protector and deliverer for us. We will go through storms of life, and he will see us through. We will go through different things in our lives. You know that. 
you've gone through things with him, there is always deliverance. There's protection and deliverance. Hallelujah. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Praise God. And lastly, and if I could ask the, the worship team to just come and get ready as we close. This passage has, I just say, thank you, Lord, for who you are. Hebrews chapter 13, as a, an amazing book comes to a close, this book of Hebrews. It says, now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead... God the Father, the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus being that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, there's a testament. In fact, I mentioned this the other, other week. For a will, you have the Old Testament, which means the old will, and then you have the New Testament. The Bible is broken into two. The New Testament has to do any testament, any will, only comes into effect when somebody dies. So my, my father-in-law and mother-in-law, they both went, have gone on to be with the Lord. They had written a will. The will did not come into effect until they were both dead. And then the will came into effect. There was benefits as a result of it. And there are benefits as a result of this New Testament, this new will that, that is given to us through Jesus Christ. It says here, let me read again. The great shepherd of the sheep, that's Jesus, is the shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant or will. It only comes through his death. And now the benefits of, of his finished work on the cross is made available to us. It says, to make you complete. Listen, here's the, the part that I really want you to focus in on. Hebrews 13, verse 21. To make you complete. Why do we glorify him? Because he can make us complete. Listen, make you, that he would make you complete in every good work, every action, every thought. Work is not just the things that we, that we do that are our, our work but have to do with every single action of who we are. Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, let him receive the glory because he's able to work out the details of your life. And you say, man, you have no idea what I'm going through right now. And I'm saying... With Jesus Christ, you will get through it. He is there to see you through it, to make you complete. Can we stand together? Hallelujah. Like these wise men, it says, When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them, till it came and stood over that where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house... They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. There is a worship of him, that we would glorify him with our lives. Tonight, if you're here and it's like, man, I'm hearing about Jesus as Jesus. To be, let him be your savior. Let him be your Lord. Let him be your purifier, your reconciler. Let him be the one that can make you complete. Let this be the Lord. And I, I mentioned about my mom leading me in a prayer, and I want to lead you in a prayer tonight. I did this morning. I want to lead you in another prayer tonight. That there would be a confession. Lord, I'm a sinner, but I recognize who you are, what you did for me on the cross. I want you in my life. So we want to, if we could, just pray this prayer together. And this morning or this evening, I'm not used to being here on a Sunday night, sorry. <laughs> this evening, pray this prayer with faith in your heart. You say, Dave, how, how great was this thing of salvation that took place in your life so long ago? I'll tell you, it is the largest 
most important decision I have ever made in my life at seven years of age. And it was by faith. Because I, hey, my mom wouldn't lie to me. As I come at my age now and having read the word, I say everything that my mom said, and even as she led me in this prayer, was about and around the word of God. So I want to pray a scripture or pray scriptures that you can give your life to Christ tonight if you don't know him as Savior. You may know about him, but you don't know him. So can we together pray? And just say, Jesus, can we say it again? Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I have sinned. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, you died for me. Because you love me. I acknowledge that. And I believe that with all my heart. That you died for me. I ask you. To come into my life. And not only save me. But be my Lord. And fill me with your spirit. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. If you believe that, hang on to that. Don't let go because Jesus has an amazing thing for you yet before he comes back. He has amazing things for you. And even in the hard times, to know that he is with you. He will be with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you is what the, wor the word of God says. He will not leave you nor forsake you. That is who we need to glorify tonight. Let's glorify him tonight. Hallelujah. It was great having you here today. If you want to listen to more messages, you can click here or here. Also, check out our website, lighthouseniagara.com, for more information and podcasts and also to give. God bless you. Have a great day.